with our opening statements, and now we'll have a 10 minute rebuttal in which each of our speakers can address the other points made. Well, thank you, Shipman. Okay, Turn on your C item. <laughs> Well, thank you, Shabir. I appreciate that opening statement you had. Okay, remember in my opening statement I said I'd be making two main points. Number one, the evidence strongly suggests that Jesus died by crucifixion and rose from the dead. And number two, Islam offers no good evidence to the contrary. So now I'd like to review those two main points in light of what Shabir just said. Let's begin with my first major point, um, that the evidence strongly suggests that Jesus died by crucifixion and rose from the dead. Now, Shabir, let's look at my primary sources here. He called some of these into question, saying, um, you've got uh, legends in the Gospels that I acknowledge this in my big book. Well, that's not necessarily the case. He mentions the angels, and what in, in my book I said that some think that the angels at the empty tomb were legendary, and I mentioned Raymond Brown, but I also assessed his arguments and said that I found them wanting. I did not find them persuasive. In terms of Matthew's raised saints, or the saints raised at Jesus' death in, in, uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 27, um, I did posit that that was a, not a legend, but a compositional device, special effects, that was a common compositional device used by Greco-Roman and Jewish authors, and I provided examples. It'd be like today if we said the events of 9-11 were earth-shaking. We really don't mean that in the literal sense. It's an idiom that we use in English. And I can show many examples in antiquity where they used things like phantoms coming back at sunset during an event that had um, cosmic or even divine significance. So I don't think it's a legend. I do think it was a compositional device. And of course, someone, you know, Shabir is saying, well, if you have that legend, what else did it, uh, he says, what else could uh, uh, Matthew have invented? Well, I think you gotta look at these things and you look at it on a case by case basis. Um, he didn't invent the resurrection because, of course, Paul and the disciples were preaching this decades before uh, Matthew even wrote his gospel. Even if we go by the dates that Shabir provided, 85, he said, for Matthew, Paul's writing 1 Corinthians uh, no later than the year 55. That's three decades before, and he's getting this from the Jerusalem apostles, who are the alleged eyewitnesses themselves. So we go right back to the Jerusalem apostles. This isn't something that Matthew made up. Um, okay, so then he says, well, you've got elaborations between these Gospels that as you get old, long, further along, you got they become more Christianized. You see oral tradition that gets uh, corrupted, and there's elaboration. Well, I would just respond to that, that um, no, that's not the way oral tradition works. It's not like the game of telephone where you whisper in someone's ear and someone's ear and they pass it around to the back and you got something totally different. I once said that, you know, with that, you've got children here, here in uh, a, an unimportant sentence one time, and then they quickly and playfully pass that along to one another in an uncontrolled manner. That's not how oral tradition worked. And I once had a kin kindergarten teacher said, you know, Mike, I do that with my kids all the time, but then you know what I do? I do something extra. I give them a new sentence and say, now you pass that back, and if you don't get it perfect, by the time you get to the end, there's no recess today. And they get it perfect every time. And the reason being is they have a reason to do it. But do you think the early Christians would have had a reason to pass this along and keep it uh, intact since this meant eternal life to them? Well, of course. And then you can see reason, ways that they did pass it along. You just go to 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul gives the Eucharistic sayings of Jesus at the Last Supper about this is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. And then you go to Luke who writes... Uh, according to Shabir's dates here, about uh, 30 years later, and it's virtually word for word. Word for word. So you can see how it was passed along this in its integrity. So it's not like this game of telephone. And besides, remember I showed in my opening statement how through Paul, he had his gospel message verified, certified by the Jerusalem apostles that, that he was preaching what they were preaching. Shabir never addressed this. And there we get Jesus' crucifixion, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised, that he appeared to individuals and groups, the friend and foe alike, and that the nature of those appearances, resurrection, involved the corpse. Shabir never addressed that. Okay, then he says, when it comes, um, 
He says, uh, well, the beloved disciple and John is not mentioned in the other Gospels. Well, he could be. It could be John. Many, including myself, think that this is the Apostle John. And he is the eyewitness, and he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. But if it's not John, it's a minor disciple. And the majority of scholars today say that the beloved disciple, that's the testimony of one of Jesus' disciples, who's the primary source for John's Gospel. Well, then, uh, about Jesus' death. I mentioned that. Um, he says, well, Pilate was surprised that Jesus had died so soon in the earliest Gospel of Mark. He was surprised, okay? But I would encourage Shabir to read the text. Just read the text. It says that when Joseph of Arimathea came to and requested the body of Jesus, Pilate was surprised that Jesus had died so soon. So he summoned the centurion, and the centurion verified that Jesus was dead. The text could not be more clear that Jesus was dead. He, uh, Shabir mentions about the Q source. It doesn't have Jesus' death. That is, um, that is correct. It doesn't have Jesus' death in the Q source. Um, but uh, the, the problem is, is that our means of identifying Q are very limited. Q, the Q material, is what appears in Matthew and Luke, but is absent from Mark. So it's entirely possible that Q in, included a narrative of Jesus' death and resurrection, but, and maybe it's included, Matthew used them, but Luke chose another source. In that case, Q could have included Jesus' death and resurrection, and we'd never know it because of our means of identifying Q are so limited. Moreover, Q could have absolutely been notes of one of Jesus' disciples who had taken Jesus' teachings, and then these later got expanded with additional traditions of Jesus, because Q is a saying source. It just has the teachings of Jesus. So if this was the case, we can understand why it wouldn't have anything about Jesus' death and resurrection. They hadn't occurred yet when he took these notes. What about raised from the dead? Shabir talks about a, um, a pre-Markan narrative that doesn't have in Mark chapter 16, verse 7, um, where they fled from the tomb, uh, or the, yeah, the, the disciples, the angel announced that the disciples will see Jesus in Galilee. I don't think there are any good reasons to, to believe that this verse wasn't in a pre-market source. The fact is, is that scholars are not in any agreement whatsoever on what a pre-market source would have included. And I believe there was a pre-market source. I think it was Peter. Because that's what the church tradition says where Mark got his primary information. And remember, I established my Earl in my opening statement that we can go right back to the Jerusalem apostles and show that they were proclaiming Jesus' death, his resurrection, his appearances to others, and that this was a bodily appearance. And again, Shabir never uh, bothered to, to, to talk about that. What about the sign of Jonah? He, uh, Shabir says, Dieter Zeller says the sign of Jonah uh, meant that Jesus was alive. Well, I think in that kind of case, it, I have to admit, the sign of Jonah, he was alive when he went into the great fish, he was alive in the fish, he was alive when he came out. So it could very well be that it meant Jesus meant that. But it could mean Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as well. So what do you do when you have a vague or ambiguous verse? Proper interpretational principles tell us to look at what else the same person says. So let's just stay in Matthew, because that's where the sign of Jonah is. And you go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Matthew 17, 22 and 23. As they gathered in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. So Jesus twice says in Matthew, he's going to die and be raised on the third day. So what do you think he means in the same book, the same gospel, when he talks about the sign of Jonah? It's pretty clear he's talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, then he talks about uh, Shabir in terms of the bodily resurrection. He says Daniel Smith's doctoral dissertation. He talks about assumption into heaven rather than death, and then a pre and source. Again, we don't know much about pre and source, really nothing about it. And that doesn't mention really anything about Jesus' resurrection. Daniel Smith argues this. Well, I, I would, look, I know Daniel Smith. He's a friend of mine. We've talked on a couple of occasions. We've emailed. In fact, we, we reviewed one another's book for the review of biblical literature. I disagree with Daniel. He's just simply wrong on this. And I said it in my review. You can look it up on bookreviews.org. 
And the problem is, we can go right back to what the Jerusalem apostles were saying. What were they teaching? Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, his appearances, and that he was raised physically from the dead. One final thing, uh, that, well anyway, that settles my first major point. My second is that the Quran offers no good evidence to the contrary. Shabir talked about how the Quran says that, um, you know, it could be the Romans killed him instead of just the Jews. He's, that's a stretch, and he knows it. And besides, if it meant that, and they could accommodate Jesus' death and resurrection, well then it agrees with the Gospels in the New Testament, and I would encourage him and all Muslims here to become Christians. In that case, if it's not, then that renders Jesus a false prophet because Jesus predicted his death and resurrection and the Quran says he didn't, so that would make him a false prophet. And in, in that, if you believe that and you're a Muslim, then I'd say leave Islam because the Quran says he's a great prophet, so it contradicts the Quran. And so I, I don't think there's good evidence from the Quran. We have every good reason to believe that Jesus died by crucifixion and that he rose from the dead. Thank you. No, I must remember to turn my mic off. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't you. Oh, you know what? I haven't turned it off. Sorry, you guys, if the battery runs over. Yeah. Okay. So, ready to go? Okay. Now, uh, folks, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that. Oops! Shouldn't have put a heavy book. See, see, that's how big my is. <laughs> no, no, no one, no one predicted a book would have been so massive. You know, okay, so fix my hat. I need to fix his hat. Okay. So uh, I may have misunderstood what Mike said about angels. So uh, in the light of what he just said, I had to look at it one more time, and, and I'll read what he what he wrote on the page I was looking at and see if it says something different than what I was saying. On page 185, Mike writes, it can, forth like, it, it can forthrightly be admitted that the data surrounding what happened to Jesus is fragmentary and could possibly be mixed with legend as Wedderburn notes. We may also be reading poetic language or legend at certain points, such as Matthew's report of the raising of some dead saints at Jesus' death, then he gives the verse number. And the angels at the tomb, then he gives the verse numbers. To me, he was agreeing with, with, with that statement. It's his own statement, but anyway, that he, that I, he's here in person, he can tell us what exactly he means. Now, as for Dieter Zeller, Dieter Zeller wasn't referring to Matthew's Gospel's uh, statement about uh, this sign of Jonah. Dieter Zeller was referring to that statement about the sign of Jonah as it is derived from the Q Gospel. And in that Gospel, there's no mention of death. And so it all ties in together. Jesus is speaking about the sign of Jonah. Jonah was obviously, as you know, alive in the belly of the uh, whale or fish, depending on which translation you use. And uh, from there he was taken out alive. So the comparison is that Jesus obviously is going to be preserved alive. Now, if we come to Matthew's Gospel, he is put in the tomb, like the belly of the whale, and now he is taken out alive, as, and remaining alive all of this time. What about the Passion Predictions? Well, I wouldn't take the Passion Predictions as uh, authoritatively and authentically from Jesus. Notice that uh, when, when the uh, crucifixion is, is, is uh, about to happen, the disciples are all in confusion and they flee from the scene. And uh, when this tomb is discovered empty according to the Gospels, nobody knows what to make, make of this. Mary Magdalene's first response is to, is to say, they've taken away the body and, uh, and we don't know where they have laid him. Uh, so nobody uh, at this point thinks, oh, well, yeah, that's, that's right. Jesus said he was going to raise from the dead, didn't, didn't you remember? Even when it says in John's Gospel that the, the disciples went to the tomb, Peter and this the, the beloved disciple again, uh, now finally they're putting pieces together. And, and John says, for to this time, they did not yet understand the scripture that Jesus is the rise from the dead. So here is the idea that the Old Testament scripture somehow says that Jesus is going to rise from the dead, but nothing is being recalled from Jesus himself saying that he must rise from the dead. So all of these passion predictions, according to many scholars, are fictional creations by the writers of the Gospels. It is not something that Jesus himself uh, spoke about. 
so, and that, that uh, it, it takes care of a major point that uh, Mike was making, that the Quran must be wrong because Jesus predicted his passion. So if the, if the Quran uh, denies his death, that means the Quran is denying what Jesus said. And since the Quran said that Jesus is a prophet, now Jesus would have to be a false prophet because he predicted his death, which didn't really happen according to the Quran. Now we're seeing that he didn't actually predict his death. Now, in, in terms of the early preaching of the, of the disciples, and uh, Mike uh, is saying that, uh, oh, the disciples were preaching that Jesus died and he was buried and so on. But read Acts of the Apostles and you will see that in fact the early preaching uh, seems to indicate that Jesus remained alive all the while. Look at uh, Peter speaking in Acts chapter 2. Certainly, in, in, the, in the way it now appears, Jesus died. True. But what is Peter referring to to prove the whole scenario about Jesus? He's referring to Psalms chapter 16. Now the 16th Psalm actually speaks about somebody who, according to the interpreter's uh, one volume commentary on the Bible, somebody who had a close brush with death, not somebody who actually died. Now go to Acts chapter 4, uh, chapter four. Peter is again preaching about the death of Jesus, and he refers to Jesus as that stone. Uh, which was rejected but became the capstone. Remember that saying of Jesus in the Gospels? Now Peter is saying, you want to know who that stone is? It is Jesus. Okay, so where do you get this from? Psalm 118. Go to Psalm 118. What does it speak about? It, speak about some, it speaks about somebody praying to God saying, rescue me. Don't let me die. And he actually specifically says, I did not die. Now, uh, the, the, the Gospels uh, speak about the crucifixion scene and uh, not knowing what specifically happened, they went to the Old Testament to find what they thought might have been predictions about somebody being crucified. So they picked on some Psalms and they picked on the book of Isaiah. So what Psalms did they pick on? Psalm 22. When Jesus was on the cross, what did he utter? Ilahi, Ilahi. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where does that come from? Psalm 22. Some Muslims listening to that will say, that doesn't sound like Jesus on the cross. I don't think like a, a prophet would be making this kind of cry of dereliction. We're all called to have faith in God no matter what the circumstance. Did he lose his faith at this moment? Well, Christian commentaries on the Bible say no. They say that Jesus must have had in mind the entire Psalm 22, not just the opening words. And when he mentions these opening words, that is like a code way of referring to the entire Psalm. So what does the entire Psalm show? The entire Psalm shows, especially towards the end, that this person is going to be rescued right here and now from out of his situation of distress. So to rescue Jesus when he was saying this means that he wouldn't die. Still with the Psalms, the Gospel of Mark shows that when the passers-by see Jesus on, on the cross, they say, aha, he who uh, did all of these wonderful things, let him come down from the cross and so on. So they say, aha, well where does this stuff, the statement aha come from? Where did Mark get it from? From uh, Psalm 40 and Psalm 70. Well there, in those two Psalms, it is clear that while the people are saying aha regarding the man of God, this man of God is praying to God, please rescue me and don't let me die. Psalm 22 shows actually that God listened to the prayer of this person. Now Hebrews uh, chapter 5 uh, shows that God heard him in the days when he cried out for help and saved him from that which he was distressed about. The Gospel according to Luke shows that an angel came down to strengthen Jesus, meaning to make him ready to go on the cross. But now we're seeing that even while he was on the cross, he was praying to be rescued and saved from death. All of this material shows that uh, the Muslim position is actually based on good ground. Now I didn't argue here that because the Quran says so, therefore it must be true. I'm showing that what the Quran actually says, even if we, uh, we discard the Quran altogether, we're seeing that Christian scholars, in peeling back the pages of their scripture, are finding that there was the earliest declaration about Jesus prior to the belief that he resurrected and came back and met his disciples and then ascended to heaven, the earlier declaration from, uh, prior to this was that Jesus was actually taken 
from the tomb. Daniel Smith thinks he was taken after he died, but still from the tomb. And uh, Dieter Zeller is saying, no, he was taken while still alive, if we uh, give credence to uh, this statement as it is found in the Q Gospel. And I'm saying that that corresponds to the Muslim belief. But of course, for Muslims, the Quran is the word of God. It doesn't matter if it came 600 years later or 6 million years later. If it is the word of God, then we believe it because uh, it is the word of God. Christians would have said that about the New Testament Gospels. This is the inspired word of God, therefore we believe what it says. But you can see that Christian scholars are not going that route now. They have critically examined uh, the Christian scriptures and they have found it uh, wanting in many ways. But for Muslims, there is still very good confirming evidence that the Quran is the word of God. I'll mention only one such thing. It comes from the world of mathematics. People are studying the Quran from a mathematical, mathematical point of view and they're finding that there are things in the Quran which seem to be arranged uh, according to some mathematical pattern. And uh, uh, th this points to the signature of God. It's, uh, it's, a book is written to convey a message, not to have a deep mathematical code, but we're noticing things, for example, what do you make of the fact that the word for a month in the singular occurs in the Quran just 12 times? Now you're thinking somebody might have counted them, right? But the word for day in the singular without any suffixes also occurs in the Quran at 365 times. Is that a mere coincidence, or is that by somebody doing the count and making sure it came out like this? Now what we know from the Quran leads us to believe that there wasn't any human being who was doing this counting, this, this is evidence that the Quran is the word of God. No time to elaborate on this further, but Muslims, I believe, are on very good ground in believing the Quran as the word of God. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, everyone. Great opening statements and rebuttal. And now we're going to engage each speaker with one another. We're going to allow each to question one another for 10 minutes. And we're going to start with Dr. Magana to get the question for 10 minutes. Okay, uh, let's just go down some of the things in the order here that Shabir said. All right, we talked about the angels and the race saints, and you said that I said that these are legendary, and you read a quote from 185. Maybe if you want to turn there and look at the footnote that I put there, that's where I said these could be candidates for it. But then I go in the footnote and say that, that Brown suggests that the angels are legendary, but that's where I say Brown's mistaken and I give reasons why. And then I do treat the raising of the saints later on and I say why that's not legendary and that's in chapter 5. So I, I, I mean, if you want to read the footnote there, it's fine. Um, Acts chapter 2. I, I think you're right that in, when Peter quotes uh, Psalm 16 verse 10, in that psalm, it's David saying, you will not allow my Holy One to see decay, meaning David expects that God is going to rescue him from death. But I agree with you there. But do you have a New Testament on you? Yes. Okay, would you just read, that's, uh, just read all down in the same chapter and read what Peter in the same sermon says in verses 23 and 24. Um, so, you know, he talks about that, uh, you know, David, uh, they quote, quote books from Psalm 16, 10, but I'd like to, in the same sermon again, verses 23 and 24, would you read those in Psalm, in uh, Acts chapter 2? Sure. Uh, 23, and the man delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God you killed, using lawless men to crucify him, but God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death, because it was impossible for him to be held by it. All right, so the same Peter who's quoting Psalm 16.10 is the same Peter in the same chapter in the same sermon who's saying Jesus died and rose from the dead. Can you tell me why you're not using a careless reading of the text in order to try to introduce doubt here about Jesus' death when the very text you're appealing to says Jesus died and rose from the dead? I, I made it plain in my, in my presentation of this that... Uh, it is true that Peter is saying that Jesus died in this passage, but whether that's originally from Peter is another issue. Because as you said in your book, uh, Acts has to be adjusted for a certain embellishment. Uh, the, the Acts is leading the story in a certain direction, in a Christian direction. And uh, so we want to peel back from this story and see what was the original situation. Now the original situation seems to be that Peter, uh, and even this may not be original, but it's an earlier situation. Peter is appealing to Psalm 16. 
And Psalm 16 speaks about somebody whose body will not uh, undergo decomposition. Right, so and how do you know that Peter hasn't reinterpreted this here for Jesus? I mean, obviously in this context, he has reinterpreted to, to apply to Jesus. Well, what I'm saying, first of all, is that we have to look at the clues here. Uh, if, 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 we, if we don't want to be detected and we just want to take the official line of, in a story, then fine, that's the official line. Jesus died, he resurrected from the dead, he met with his disciples, he finally ascended to heaven. That's the official line. But when, when writers are writing the official line, but they leave traces of an earlier version of the story, now that becomes interesting. The trace of the earlier version of the story here is that we are referring to a person whose body did not decompose. Now, it is also possible that uh, at the time when people were thinking of this, they did not have the clear senses we have today to differentiate between somebody who is uh, in, in a state of coma and somebody who has actually finally died. Yeah, but on the cross you would. But, but we, know, uh, we know that decomposition and death goes to, go together. Uh, if a person has died, his body becomes decomposed. If his body is not decomposing, that means he has not died. So you have said in your book that this um, this passage means that uh, if the, the person did not his body did not suffer decomposition. That's so true. so if his body did not suffer decomposition, that means Jesus did not die. Now the logic of the story. I, no, I, I don't find that severe. And and you have the same guy who's I, really I think it's quite a stretch for you to say that he's quoting this and there's a pre-act source. Remember, Luke got his information from eyewitnesses. He got it from Paul, he got it from Mark, he got it from Q. And so these are eyewitnesses. And again, that does not do anything to address the arguments I gave for how we can get back to how what the Jerusalem apostles themselves were proclaiming, that Jesus died and that he rose and appeared to them because his corpse had been raised. Well, let me address the, the idea that Luke is getting this uh, from Paul and these there and I'll tell you what, I would rather you, because we are limited in time, I'd rather you address what I've said about this goes right back to the Jerusalem apostles themselves. How do, uh, I gave arguments through Paul, he has his gospel message certified by the Jerusalem apostles in preaching what they're preaching. They're preaching Jesus' death, resurrection, and, and violent resurrection. So, how do you address that, what the evidence is not getting? Well, it is not so clear that what Paul is saying actually goes back to the Jerusalem Apostles. Uh, uh, Paul is saying that this is tradition I have received. He doesn't say who he received it from. Well, he did say he got it certified from the Jerusalem Apostles. And we do have Paul well, and Carpenter no, 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 I think you're tying pieces together here. Well, when Paul in 1 Corinthians is not saying I got this from the Jerusalem Apostles. Elsewhere he says, I met with the Jerusalem Apostles. But elsewhere he also says, what I'm teaching I did not receive from any man. I got it as a revelation from God. Right. So it, it is possible that Paul received this information from other sources, other than the original Jerusalem Apostles. Well, in terms, and, of, the, in terms of the credo, the, the formula that has been given down, but, it, it, but still, the, the content of that, we know that he ran that by the Jerusalem Apostles, and they agreed, hey, that's what we're preaching. I think you're reading things into, into the meetings. They, they, when, when the meetings were convened in Jerusalem, it was about dietary law. Uh, should we impose dietary law on the Gentiles? There was no meeting convened to say, okay, what are we going to agree uh, uh, to preach about the resurrection of Jesus? Well, Acts, Acts mentions the dietary laws in the Jewish law, whether Gentiles can be part of it and whether they need to be circumcised, they all need to be circumcised and all that. But Paul does say that they certified that He's running the gospel message, so it doesn't mean that they didn't discuss that as well. And remember, Polycarp said that Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. Let, let me move on, though, a little bit. I don't want to get caught up on this. Um, you talked about how um, you've got Dieter Zeller uh, said that Matthew, the sign of Jonah, was not referring to uh, Matthew, but uh, the sign, uh, Matthew with the sign of Jonah, but the Q in which there's no mention of Jesus' death. So what do, you, what do you do with my argument here that Q could very well have been notes taken by Jesus, one of Jesus' disciples, while he was still alive? And so therefore, it wouldn't mention his death and resurrection. It's a far stretch to say that somebody took notes uh, as Jesus was preaching while he was still alive. Why? Uh, because uh, other disciples and teachers did that. That was common. There, there is no trace in, in the early church that anyone had notes uh, from which they preached uh, the, the sayings of Jesus. That's an argument for silence. And the, the way in which the teaching material about Jesus was being handled in the gospel showed that there was no authoritative teaching from Jesus. People wrote and others uh, thought it uh, within their, um, 
they, they thought they had the authority to change what was being said. So, for example, uh, we, we have the same saying of Jesus appearing in various Gospels, apparently the same saying, but with significant modifications. We have people introducing statements into the uh, into the mouth of angels, for example. You spoke about the angels at the tomb. Well, in, in Mark's Gospel, the angels say, go tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee. Uh, but uh, as he told you, that because he had already told them that in, in in Mark 14, 28. But in Matthew's Gospel, it doesn't say, as I told you. It says, I have told you. Right. Why? Because Matthew is leaving the scene open for the uh, for, for Jesus to appear to the women. And he's going to tell the women himself. That, that's and, true. But so, you do have a common device in antiquity called transferal. We find it in Plutarch. We find it in Suetonius. We find it in, 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 in Sallust and, and all this. So but this then a lot common. of things that might have been transferred and put in the mouth of Jesus that he didn't well, say. Well, the message is still the same. Okay. I mean, um, you're assuming that, Mike, but... but we're no, not because here. this is a common literary yeah. device at all, that most authors use. Let, let me move on to Hebrews 5.7, because I'm running out of time here. Uh, you, you said in Hebrews, you appeal to that, where it says, Jesus offered prayer to him who could save him from death, and his prayers were answered. Um, well, uh, you know, that could mean that he was rescued from death. It could also uh, have a different meaning. So let's look at what else Hebrews says. Chapter 2, verse 9, Jesus, because of the suffering of death... Crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Five verses later, verse 14. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil. Chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now, may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, Jesus our Lord. So, obviously, the author of Hebrews thought that Jesus had died. He says that three times, and he mentions resurrection once. I think it's a more plausible explanation that this author who believes in Jesus' death and resurrection means when he said his prayers were answered, that God uh, brought him up front. He didn't allow him to meet, and he wrote, re resurrected him. How would you address that? Well, they, that passage that I'm referring to in Hebrews specifically says that God heard him in that very manner in which he feared. And now, we're, we're, of course, the rest of Hebrews is saying that Jesus died. I'm not denying that. That's the official line. But is there an earlier... Is the same author is. There was an earlier tradition, though, uh, in which it was recalled that Jesus uh, made this prayer and his prayer was answered. I'm showing from all of these signs, yes, that was the earlier prayer. He was, even on the cross, or even in that situation of great distress, if we apply to Jesus, uh, that to Jesus while he was on the cross, that's when he's making that prayer, and that's when God rescues him and saves him from death. That's the earlier tradition. Well, now, but you have no evidence that that's an earlier in the book, tradition. It's not at all. Nothing written, nothing. It's pure speculation. In, in the book, Deconstructing Jesus by Robert Price, Robert Price says that Muslim scholars have uh, pointed to clues for a long time. And Robert Price that. denies the existence but, of Jesus. But, period. So, but, uh, using literary techniques, Robert Price is saying, now we can look at these clues that were pointed out by Muslim scholars, and we're seeing, yeah, there are clues here pointing to an idea that Jesus was actually rescued and saved from death. Yeah, and he uses those same clues to deny Jesus' existence. Uh, but that's another matter. But uh, do these clues point to the idea that Jesus might have been rescued from death? Uh, and I think yes. Javier, okay. you have 10 minutes to cross the table. Ask your question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, Mike, I, I don't want to like put you on the spot or anything. I just want to uh, get your ideas because you're a scholar. And here is a, a book, Acts and Christian Beginnings, uh, from the Acts Seminar. Are you familiar with this book by Dennis Smith and, and Joseph Tyson? I am not. Okay. And then uh, I would recommend that you get a copy and, and read it. Um, why? Uh, because you, you rely on, on, on the age-old uh, convention that Luke was a companion of Paul and that he wrote uh, probably around 85, even as I is, uh, put up there on, on the screen. Which that, is that the view of the majority of scholars. Yes. Uh, now there is an emerging group of scholars. This, this is a, the, the result of 10 years of study by the people we know as the Jesus Seminar. Now they're the Acts Seminar. Over 10 years to study Acts of the Apostles. And their conclusion is that uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostles is not written by a traveling companion of Paul, but was written probably around the year 115. And uh, this answers a lot of the puzzles that previously uh, struck us, because we know that there, there are discrepancies between uh, Paul's statements, for example, in Galatians, and what is actually found in Acts. And you've alluded to that in your book as well. 
So uh, th this solves the problem in that what they're saying is that an Acts of the Apostles was written by somebody who wanted to rehabilitate Paul. Why? Because in the first part of the second century, Marcion was using Paul's writings to champion a particular brand of Christianity which did not become mainstream. And the uh, Acts of the Apostles wanted to bring the writings of Paul and Paul's character himself into the mainstream. And so Acts of the Apostles shows, yes, that uh, when Paul comes to Jerusalem, the disciples meet him, there is some hesitation, but eventually they're getting along. Uh, though not ex extremely quite well, but you can see that they're getting along. So uh, I think you need to uh, now take into consideration that the support that you thought that Paul had in Acts of the Apostles may not be so very strong, because Acts of the Apostles itself may, is not an unbiased source, but uh, thoroughly biased uh, towards Paul. Okay, well first of all, bias doesn't mean you're wrong. If that were the case, then African-American historians could never write on slavery in the U.S. A Jewish historian could never write on the Holocaust, okay? So bias doesn't mean you're wrong, it just means that you are there for a cause. And if Jesus was who he claimed to be and he rose from the dead, well then the disciples, yes, they're biased about the message, but rightly so. Uh, I'm biased. I believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. I believe he rose from the dead, so yes, I'm biased toward the Christian message. You're biased toward the Muslim message. That doesn't mean that either of us are wrong because we're biased. In terms of the book there written by the Jesus Seminar, the Jesus Seminar, nobody pays much attention to them anymore. They were very popular in the 90s and the early 2000s, but they are a group of scholars on the radical left. There's about 150 of them that signed up for it in a whole history of the Jesus Seminar. Many of them are dead, so it's less than that now. Um, many of the Jesus Seminar fellows deny the existence of God. If you want to say that they're unbiased scholars, well, that's a far cry. John Dominic Carlson is an atheist. Um, Stephen Patterson, another prominent fellow, doesn't believe that God exists in any sense like the Muslim Christian Abrahamic God, um, that he, if God exists at all, he's just a force, an impersonal force, and when we die, there's no afterlife, and so it's more like we're absorbed into the universe. So their views are quite a bit different than ours, a lot of the Jesus Seminar fellows. I'm going to rely more on, and by the way, there's usually no more than 30 or 40 of them, according to what Stephen Patterson told me, who even vote on these things. So it's not even that much of an emergence of uh, number of scholars. It's a radical group of scholars on the way out there on the fringe of the theological left and not in touch with mainstream scholarship. If you want to know where mainstream scholarship is on Acts, I'd encourage you to read Craig Keener's seminal four-volume work on commentary on the Book of Acts, which is over 5,000 pages, 624 pages itself, just devoted to the introduction of Acts. And there he talks about where the majority of scholars are today. And he says the majority of scholars do hold that uh, Luke, uh, the author of Acts, was a traveling companion of Paul. Of course, uh, I looked into Pat Keener's uh, work, and I found that Pat Keener is admitting that he is writing from a conservative Christian point of view. So naturally, he's biased the other way. I think we need to take all of these writings into consideration. And uh, the yeah, majority of scholars. Well, he probably means the majority of conservative no, no, scholars. No, 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 no not at all. Because he I, cites Richard Furbo and all these guys who think Acts is a novel. I, I, can, I can cite many scholars who, for, who, for example, Ernest Henschen, uh, in commentary on Acts of the Apostles. Uh, several scholars think that the idea that Luke was a traveling companion of, of Jesus is actually uh, not done very sound. Uh, well, that's true, but the majority basis. of scholars would disagree. Well, it depends on how you define who is a scholar, because what so I, I said... who has a PhD in a relevant field and has published peer review. Well, they may also be starting out as Christians who decide to pursue a PhD in that field because they are really believing uh, Christians and that's what they want to study and that's what they want to defend, just like, for example, yourself. And just like I pursued Islamic study, I'm already a Muslim. But if we, uh, we, we, we don't get caught up with the, who's a scholar, who's not, and who has the PhD and who doesn't, we look at the facts of the matter and we see that there are discrepancies between what Paul says about himself and what is said in Acts of the Apostles. If Acts of the Apostles was written by a traveling companion of Paul, these discrepancies are difficult to explain. But I want to shift ground well, here. They're not difficult to explain. I want to shift ground. Okay. Uh, you, you have uh, spoken about Paul's uh, uh, statement about Jesus being uh, dead and now he's in a glorified uh, body. Now, it, it seems to me, and I want to run this by you, it seems to me that Paul is saying that, okay, Jesus uh, was raised up and he, uh, he is now clothed with that heavenly body which he had previously left in heaven. Because for 
Paul, Jesus was a heavenly figure. He came down, left that heavenly form. He came down to the form of a servant. Now he leaves the form of a servant, and now he goes back to be clothed with the heavenly body. So the comparison breaks down here with the ordinary Christian because, uh, or with, with Christians in general, because Christians in general did not start out in heaven and leave the heavenly body to go back to. So they, their bodies will be transformed. So that does not mean that Jesus' body was transformed. It just simply means he came into this world, adopted a body, he left the body like the clothing that we wear, and he put back on the heavenly body that he had left in heaven in the first place. How do you respond to that? Well, I think you misinterpreted uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, when it says that, he, that Jesus existed in the form of God. That he uses the term morphe there. In, in the context, I think when you take it contextually, that is used to mean the role of God. So he existed in the role of God. He didn't regard that role as something to hold on to, but he emptied himself of that role in the divine lifestyle, and he took on the role of a servant. Uh, not the form, because then later on, he, it says he, and being found in appearance as human, okay, he took on that, he took on the role of a servant, but then he took on uh, human appearance, okay, so it's a role that he's talking about there, he gave up that role, that divine role, and took on the role of a servant, that's why uh, Jesus is reported in Mark, the earliest gospel, saying the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he took on the role of a servant, had nothing to do with his body. Um, Isaiah, Isaiah 53 is often uh, used uh, as a reference to the death of Jesus, but you're aware that Isaiah 53, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the copy, uh, does not mention death in Isaiah 53 9. How, how do you reconcile that uh, with, with what we've been discussing? Because it seems to be proof in my favor that uh, they, the, the, the passage which was looked at as a prediction about Jesus doesn't actually predict his death, but actually predicts his suffering in this case. No. So he suffered, but did not die. How do you respond to that? Well, I just go back to what I think what's most important here is what the Jerusalem apostles were teaching. And as I showed, through Paul we can say that he, we can certify that he was teaching the same gospel message as the Jerusalem apostles, and they were teaching Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised, and that he appeared, and that those appearances were of such nature that it was a bodily resurrection. Now, you said in your opening presentation that uh, Jesus was Yahweh, and then you immediately added that God raised him from the dead. Yeah. So did God raise Yahweh from the dead? Well, I, I think you look at it the way I, I, I see this in the scriptures, is Jesus is God in some sense, that God, he's God's son, he existed in the role of God. Um, I see it a lot, I could use the example of a marriage, and uh, you've got two people, two separate people, but the Bible says that the two become one flesh. That doesn't mean they're joined in the flesh and all that. It means they become one unit. So the way Christians view God is that you have one God who's manifested in three distinct persons. They have different roles. The Son and the Holy Spirit are subject to the Father, but they have three separate roles, but they make up one unit, God. So is either of them extendable? Like could you, like could one of them die and two of them just remain, in which case one of them is extendable? No. Okay. So then the, the one did not really die, he only kind of suspended his, uh, like he went to sleep for a while. No, it's, uh, he was, his body died. It'd be kind of like us, I mean, I think the Christian view is when a, when a person dies, to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. So their person, the spirit, continues to live, and the spirit never dies even though the body does. So I would say the same thing with Jesus. But wouldn't that be the, the, the earthly body that was prepared for him, which was not really God from all eternity? So that's not really God that died. The, the body died, okay. So that's not God. The that's body right. died. Uh, well, Jesus was in the body. The body certainly died, and Jesus was under the curse of God. But uh, God raised him from the dead and vindicated him. But then Jesus who was the eternal spirit as, as the eternal word of God. That's right, the God spirit never died. died. The, the body, body never died, only a body died. The body died. But that's a human body. The human body Created died. in this world. Yes. Okay. Let's give it a hand.